riches we were promised. They stand. They are unruly and therefore cannot be ruled. <laughs> to challenge them is to court death. Welcome back to The Great Expanse by John Bat 426 here on YouTube. So glad you guys are tuning in. So glad the channel is growing. And no, I don't have a million subscribers, but guess what? I got 60 something. And I'm appreciative for every subscriber. Because you can only count by one. Actually, you can multiply and go well past one. But anyway, I'm glad for each and every one of you, okay? Hopefully the channel will get bigger so we can reach a larger audience so that more people will see how great comic books are. And those comic books are represented in iterations in movies, live action television series, almost it's series is, <laughs> but live action television series, cartoons, computer generated features, comic books rule, all right? And that's what this channel is about. It's about exploring how great comic books are. The comic book medium, obviously the MCU is a multi-billion dollar franchise and it was based in Marvel Comics, all right? There's also DC Comics, there's Image Comics, there's Dark Horse, there's the Vertigo imprint, there's a Black Label, there was formerly Wildstorm, and there's so many other great independent uh, comic book companies out there. Comic books are just a great medium, you know what I mean? And uh, back to me, <laughs> if you've liked the videos that you've seen thus far on the channel, please hit that like button. If you dislike them, hit the dislike button. Share the videos with other people that you know that like comic book related things. You might have a friend that you might just recall and go, I remember Billy used to like comic books. Maybe he liked The Great Expanse by John Bat 426 So subscribe to the channel. Tell Billy to subscribe to the channel. Billy, I am The Great Expanse by John Bat 426 Subscribe to the channel if you like comic books and stuff, Billy. Okay. Or Marsha. Or Jamal. Or Veronica, anybody. If you like comic book related things and somebody's sharing this with you, what a gift. Even after Christmas, you can still get great gifts. Yay. Subscribe to the channel so when a new <laughs> a new video is dropped, you'll know about it second and I will know about it voice. I'm not the one breath chant today. I usually do that all in one breath, but I'm just here to talk to you guys because whenever I record these videos, it feels like it's been a long time since I recorded the previous video. So I'm usually just Ebullient, another great word for the great expanse by John Bat 426 here on YouTube. So, this headline jumped off the screen. The website is Collider. It says, the MCU's behind the scenes drama is more interesting than the movies. We'll see about that. Hopefully this isn't clickbait. Hopefully this has some concrete facts to it. Because I definitely don't want to waste you guys time with clickbait. And the author of this article is Liam Gogan, I think. I think that's how you say it. Gog Gogan, whatever. With so much drama in the LBC... Oh, I'm sorry. With so much drama taking place behind the scenes ahead of Phase 5, is Marvel's dominance at the box office over? Before I read the article, no, their dominance is not over. All right? It's incredible how much popular media culture has radically changed since the release of the Avengers a decade ago. That was 2012, when the Avengers uh, debuted in theaters. Comic book, comic book films had certainly been popular before Joss Whedon's comic book crossover event, as the Spider-Man, X-Men, and the Dark Knight franchises had all been cultural events and box office sensations. However, it seemed like with the Avengers, Marvel Studios had done the impossible. The dream of seeing characters come together for a splash cover crossover event that worked on its own terms was like seeing... I'm sorry, a pop-up. Where was I? Crossover event that worked on its own terms was like seeing everyone's childhood dream brought to life. Marvel had somehow enlisted great actors and filmmakers to treat Stanley's material like modern mythology. And that's what comic books are. Modern mythology. The success of Phase 2 and Phase 3 was again built on a seemingly impossible conceit. Marvel Studios was building anticipation for their upcoming projects and laying the seeds for an ultimate conclusive event, but they were still allowing individual filmmakers to bring their auteur personalities to their films. 
Iron Man 3 with Shane Black's buddy cop dark comedy. Guardians of the Galaxy was James Gunn's wonderfully weird family comedy. Spider-Man Homecoming was John Watts' modern coming-of-age comedy. Thor Ragnarok was Taika Waititi's campy space opera, and Black Panther was Ryan Coogler's timely political thriller. While not every film was equal in quality, the consistent output was rather stunning, as Fox's X-Men franchise and Warner Brothers' DCEU continued to produce mixed results, Marvel Studios appeared to be leagues ahead of their competitors. With the success of Infinity War and Endgame, which briefly landed the honor of being the number one highest grossing film of all time before Avatar won back the prize, it seemed like Marvel had peaked, and unfortunately, that assessment has been correct. The question going into Phase 4 was an obvious one. Where do you go next? As I said, I didn't have Marvel fatigue, I had Mar Marvel wonderment. Where do you go after Endgame? As the franchise continues to double down on crossovers and produce more content than ever before, the results have been messier. Not Mark Messier, but messier. Spelled the same way. He played hockey, for those that didn't know. He's a legend. Shout out to Mark Messier. The quality has been inconsistent, and the overarching story has become impenetrable to casual viewers. Amid these creative lows, the real interesting narrative of the MCU is how it treats its filmmakers and how the franchise has changed Hollywood forever. Phase 4 was met with one crisis that no one could have predicted, the shuttering of movie theaters as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Unsurprisingly, this forced every studio in the industry to begin questioning their future, which was a hard pill to swallow for Marvel. Kevin Feige had been praised by industry insiders and fans for his ability to plan years ahead, mapping out every step of the story. However, the less reliable box office, the advent of Disney Plus as a streaming venue, venture, excuse me, and a less enthusiastic audience seemingly forced him to make some clumsy adjustments. Marvel Studios started off Phase 4 with a few signs that they had taken their stars and talent for granted. The general attitude toward the Black Widow standalone film is that it was simply years too late. I believe Black Widow should have been re released in that socket between Captain America the Winter Soldier and Avengers Age of Ultron. That would have been perfect for a Black Widow movie, in my opinion and felt like a half-hearted apology to Scarlett Johansson and the fans for the constant mistreatment of Natasha Romanoff, as her storyline in Age of Ultron in particular invoked controversy. In the Age of Ultron, I think they're talking about when she sort of had a... She's kind of flirting with Bruce Banner a little bit, suggesting that maybe Banner and Romanoff were going to have a romantic future. Maybe. It was different. It was a risk. I applaud risks. I didn't mind that, okay? This was further complicated by the pay disputes with Johansson as a result of the film's simultaneous, simultaneous release pattern. Moreover, mar marketing techniques seemed to paint Johansson as the villain, a particularly disturbing message to send in an industry where women are constantly underpaid. There was another blunder that invoked the attention of Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings star Simi Liu when Disney CEO Bob Chapek referred to the film's release as an experiment. Was this critical moment of Asian representation nothing more than a way for a conglomerate to test out a release pattern? It was also clear from the 2021 output that Marvel was no longer building a universe where casual fans could simply opt in for whichever project interested them. You wouldn't be able to understand the upcoming Doctor Strange sequel if you hadn't already watched WandaVision, and the big bad for the multiverse saga was revealed until the end of the Loki series. Probably should, should have said wasn't revealed, okay? It raised interesting questions about the role that studios had over fans. Would they be willing to watch movies and shows that didn't interest them simply in order to keep up? Reviews for the Disney Plus shows and Phase 4 films were mixed, with Eternals earning the studio its first real critical bomb. Eternals was nowhere near as bad as Thor, Love and Thunder, or that other series that I will not mention on this channel ever again, okay? At the same time, it seemed like the universe was getting so big that adjustments had to be made at the last minute and the studio couldn't handle all the changes. Understandable. COVID-19 forced the Falcon and the Winter Soldier to rework its storyline, and elements of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness seemed out of line with Wanda's character arc in WandaVision. It's no surprise that thus far, the most acclaimed project in Phase 4 was Spider-Man no, no Way Home, a film that simply coasts on nostalgia and tells a self-contained story. All right. I hope this article is coming to an end. 
because this is a lot of reading. As the creative blunders raised questions about the studio's commitment to the fans, there's been an increasing issue of directors being replaced or disrespected for not falling in line with Marvel's marching orders. The signs of this had briefly cropped up in Phase 2, but considering Edgar Wright had been developing Ant-Man before the MCU was forming, and Patty Jenkins' idea for Thor The Dark World needed some work, these creative differences were somewhat understandable. However, the idea that Marvel was nothing without its corporate overlords was highlighted when James Gunn was briefly fired from Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 over controversial comments, which had been resurrected on social media by a right-wing conspirator. Additionally, Marvel seemed averse to letting directors make any more bold risk that would divulge too far from formula. After all, Scott Derrickson had initially promised Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness would be the first scary MCU film, and then left the project for mysterious creative differences. The most shocking change came recently when Jan Demange was brought in to direct Blade after his previous director, Bassam Tariq, mysteriously stepped away shortly before filming was scheduled to begin. Uh, let me go down real fast and see how much there is left to this article. Because this feels like a lot of reading. Okay, this last bit is the end of the article. And then we're going to get to what you want to hear. Me! Talking. <laughs> it's no wonder that Marvel Studios' cultural domination has invoked the concern of some of the industry's all-time greatest filmmakers. In the decades since the release of The Avengers, every studio has seemingly adopted the same multimedia crossover approach and attempted to replicate its success. While Hollywood has always had its eyes turned toward sequels, we've seen franchises like DC, Star Wars, Star Trek, Ghostbusters, Dark Universe, MonsterVerse, Lord of the Rings, and Game of Thrones all attempt to adopt the same model to mixed results. At a time when everyone is chasing Marvel, the originator of these industry trends is experiencing more setbacks than ever. It's getting harder to keep up with Marvel's output, as the sheer volume of content can perhaps only be consumed by true diehard fans that will accept any faults in the system in order to have the complete experience. However, the unraveling behind-the-scenes drama is a far more fascinating, fascinating story, and one that may indicate where the anime entertainment industry is going in the future. That's the end of the article. Let me close this off. Close, I said. Okay. Now, Marvel has, I don't really know what the term is, but since Marvel is the big dog, everyone that sings its praises will quickly turn around and become the biggest detractors. That's just, I don't know why that's natural among human beings. But the things that are stalwarts, the things that are consistent in our life, they're so there. I don't know if that sentence makes sense, but they are so there, they are so constant, that eventually we grow to criticize it and we grow to loathe it because it's always there. Now, as I said, phase four of Marvel is the worst phase ever, primarily because of the reception from the audience, okay? I said Phase 2 probably didn't have the best lineup, but we were still just gobbling up everything Marvel. Because we knew where it, was, where it was leading, okay? We knew that Thanos was on the horizon. We knew that at the end of Avengers. We see him, you know, turn, looking very purple, and showing some teeth. After the other says, To challenge them is to court death. And we know, according to the comic books, Thanos worships death. But they changed him in... Infinity War and Endgame. And I'm going to say it right now since I'm on the topic. That was not Thanos in an Infinity War and Endgame. You know who that was? Which major Marvel MCU villain has always been about survival of the fittest and balance? Apocalypse. That wasn't Thanos. That was Apocalypse. Thanos is a madman that worships death. He doesn't care about balance. All right, I got that out. <laughs> Back to this. This was gonna eventually happen, okay? Because remember, the whole question of this article is, where does Marvel go after Endgame? That's what we're still talking about. Because we're not satisfied with what we've gotten. We're not. That's why I said they have mixed results. That's why I was about, uh, I did a video right here on The Great Experience by John Matt 426, where Marvel's considering quality over quantity. Now, you think that would be a staple 
of a movie studio, of any kind of production company, quality over quantity. Because when you put out too much quantity, that costs money to make a whole bunch of stuff. When you can save money and invest it in something that will guarantee you box office returns. So this was this was going to happen. Even when Endgame was over, I was sitting in uh, the movie theater with my family, who I went to see it with, waiting for like an end credit scene, and all you hear is hammering. And I presume that's hearkening back to the first Marvel film. It wasn't quite the MCU because Disney hadn't taken over when Iron Man came out in 2008. Okay. Was it 2008? Yes, it was 2008. Same year The Dark Knight and The Incredible Hulk came out. So I'm assuming that that's Iron Man hitting it. It's like a throwback. Ding, ding. And when the movie was over, I was thinking, where does Marvel go from here? It's like, how do you introduce new characters that we haven't seen before and still keep that 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 blockbuster atmosphere phase five i mean sorry phase four they've had one blockbuster spider-man no way home the reason why that's a blockbuster is because you borrowed from sam raimi you borrowed from the amazing spider-man i don't know who the director of the, the amazing spider-man movies were there were hints alfred molina was going to be in it willem dafoe was going to be in it andrew garfield was going to be in it and toby mcguire you couldn't help but have a blockbuster on your hands when you're bringing in the former Spider-Man actors that people still want to see. People still want to see a fourth Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie, and they still want a third Andrew Garfield film as Spider-Man. Because the, the second one, which I didn't like that much, was setting up the Sinister Six. The Sinister Six was going to be the next film. We're still anticipating seeing those actors, Garfield and Maguire, as Spider-Man. So... This was just going to be a an orgasmic event, regardless. And Spider-Man No Way Home is the only blockbuster of Phase 4. And it grossed over a billion dollars. So it did very well. But most people will tell you that's all that movie. This is a brainless sham that's st stoked in nostalgia. And that's all the movie has going for it is nostalgia. But in fairness to the film, after the death of Aunt May, Ned Lee, Michelle, MJ, I, I, whatever, another stupid mistake made. How, how do you make that dumb mistake? How is she not Mary Jane Watson? How? How? And Peter Parker get serious. They stop being clowns. And that is a departure from the Spider-Man character. Because Spider-Man's world changes when Uncle Ben is murdered. They did it a little different this time around. Uh, I don't remember if there was an Uncle Ben in this universe. But apparently he got bitten by a radioactive spider and decided to become a local vigilante. With no conviction. He didn't have that with great power comes great responsibility. So it was like, it's almost a question of like, you're just doing it because of Iron Man? So Iron Man basically became like Uncle Ben. In Endgame, when he died, I was like, all right, Peter Parker's going to go sob over him and just soak Robert Downey Jr.'s character's face in tears. And that'll be the death of Uncle Ben. That'll be what propels him to be Spider-Man. But no, they did it different. They had Marissa Tomei's Aunt May die, and that was kind of his jumping point. And it's done very well. But the only thing going for that blockbuster is nostalgia. And everyone knows it. All right, the story itself, trash, utter garbage. Doctor, I almost said Dr. Seuss, might as well. Dr. Strange's spell that broke the multiverse. Does that make sense? That resurrected Otto Octavius and Norman Osborn and selectively didn't pick up Topher Grace's Venom, didn't pick up Kirsten Dunst's Mary Jane. Does that make that that's so stupid? That is so dumb. And the fact that there was a magic button, there was a box. It was almost like the box in uh Doctor Who with the, the Zygon inversion and the Zygon invasion, the two-part episode where if you push the button, it'll like either blow up London, but really it just like alters your memories. I'll, okay, I won't get into Doctor Who. I love Doctor Who. Okay. But she has a box with a magic button. 
that if she pushes this button, all the bad guys will go back to their regular universes. What? <laughs> really? A magic box to send people to different universes? You don't even need an infinity, an infinity gauntlet. You don't even need a spell anymore. You got a magic box with a button. And Ned Lee having the sorcery ability to do the sling ring thing and bring Andrew Gar well no Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire were already in Tom Holland's universe okay when the spell happened he opened like is a voice activated sorcery and the user doesn't need any sort this is the stupidest Spider-Man film ever made the stupidest but as I said this is Marvel Phase 4's only blockbuster, and it's dumb, but it's awesome. I, I'm not even going to lie to you. I was geeking out in the second half of the movie. I call it a tale of two movies. By the time Aunt May dies, I'm invested. But still, it's stupid, okay? But yeah, Marvel, get back to what you do best. Quality stories, all right? Build, okay? Suspense. Why is Kang an Ant-Man? The namesake of the next Avengers movie, Avengers Kang Dynasty, is going to have his second showing in Ant-Man! And that's the only reason why a lot of people are going to watch this movie, is for Kang. And Ant-Man, King is in the microverse. As I said, this is, when I saw the trailer, I did a review for the trailer right here on The Great Expanse by John Bat 426. I said, I'm not watching this. I, I didn't say it this vehemently, but, and I said, if, if, if a friend says, yeah, let's go check it out, I, I probably want to go see it because of the visuals and all that stuff, but the selling point of an Ant-Man movie is Kang. This is shameless. We need you guys to go watch this Ant-Man movie, so let's put the big bad, the Thanos, after the Thanos after Thanos, Kang, in an Ant Man movie. Marvel, get back to making quality stories, okay? Forget trends, forget focus groups. Go back and write quality movies with quality characters. Echo is not a quality character. She has a series coming up in Disney's Phase 5 on Disney+. Plus. I mean, uh, Marvel's Phase... MCU's Phase 5 in Disney+. Plus. Agatha Harkness gets her own series. Not a quality character. Ironheart, Riri Williams. Not a quality character. No. These are not quality characters. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. They are not going to send people to the theaters when they make their debuts in movies. Many people that saw Black Panther Wakanda Forever said, Why is Riri Williams in this movie? Because she has a series coming up. Marvel, get rid of the trash. I'm not saying the actresses are trash. I'm not saying that at all. The characters, the fact that they're getting their own series is a trash idea. Get the trash out of your phases. Go back to the drawing boards write quality stories and bring people back to the theaters all right or even back to disney plus get some good stuff on disney plus secret invasion looks good it looks quality you got samuel l jackson starring that's a quality character nick fury with one of the greatest actors of all time samuel l jackson get back to that get great actors back abandon the trevor slattery character and recast the awesome ben kingsley sir ben kingsley Please, please, if you've appreciated this article that I've read, if you appreciated my rant, my spiel after the article, hit the like button. If you didn't like it, hit the dislike button. If you got comments, and I always appreciate reading your comments, you know where to put them, courtesy of David Brent. That's where your comments go. And let's make the, this channel grow. Let's let the Great Expanse live up to his namesake and expand his in the name.